my name's Pete Yarwood. I'm the Chief Officer of Red Rose Recovery. And just to antagonise Mark, I'm going to throw a few numbers at you. We've got a smallish charity, employ about 28 people. The last quarter I've just reported on it, so we have to still count widgets. Our volunteers have contributed in terms of the economic value back into the community 3,300 hours, round about there, has an economic value of about £30,000. We want to double that. Our volunteers giving back into the community are the lifeblood of our organisation. So every time I start a, a talk off by announcing I'm the Chief Executive Officer, I still think, you're not really, stop kidding yourself. Because it kind of puts me at the top of the organisation and I, I'm not there to be at the top of it. I'm, I'm there to support the people who need that support to enable them to, to do what they do best. So I, I think I still need to work on that. But it also kind of says I've done it on my own and I haven't. This is something that we've done together. We've built this community, we've built this organisation and I'm really proud of that. One of, the, one of the main things I learned in, you know, on the team of there um, was when your decision maker is broken, hand over your decision making responsibility, you dummy. It, taught, it, caught, it took me about 20 years to realise that, that simple lesson. Um, like Matthew, my, my journey started a good family. Um, I was a high achiever in school, but brown powder epidemic hit Manchester and, um, and in my community, Moss Side, that was like the pinnacle, that, that was a real hot spot. So um, it's not rocket science to, to make the connection from a high achiever to within the space of one year entering the criminal justice system as a 15 year old child. And I was one of them who put my hand up and said, yeah, I'm addicted to Class A's and I need some help. And the prison officer said, don't worry, we'll look after you tonight and we'll put you in the hospital. And I had an idea of what a hospital looked like. So when he led me to the dungeons uh, and tried to say, get in that strip cell, I questioned it and he painted a vivid illustration of what he'd do to me very quickly if I didn't walk into that cell. So I did. The very next morning, um, after a night, lay awake, lay on, on a wooden platform as a 15-year-old child, I could hear activity, I could hear keys jangling, I could hear activity on the landing, so I went up to the crack in the door to, to, to get some connection with, with another human being. And the cleaner work was cleaning the landing, I could hear the mop slapping at the bottom of the door, and I said, hey mate, you know, uh, what's what is this? I'm supposed to be in the hospital and this guy, um, he just opened up a torrent of abuse on me and, and basically what he was saying to me, on site, as soon as I get the barest of opportunity, I'm going to hurt you very badly. And I could not understand why another prisoner had so much animosity to me. Why, why, why does he want to paint my, you know, my, the, what, what have I done to you? You know, couldn't comprehend until he said to me, uh, on the other side of my cell door, on white A4 paper in big red letters, were written the words virus. And back in the 80s, if you presented as an intravenous drug user, it didn't matter whether you was a child or not, you had AIDS. Uh, and that was me, I was marked. So I seen the doctor later on that morning and he let me up onto to the main location. Um, my first experience of my first day in prison was being knocked unconscious. I don't know who hit me or what they hit me for. And when I woke up in a pool of blood, I've still got the scar on my eye to this very day to remind me of that. I swore every day of that prison sentence, I would never go back to prison. And, and I promise my family, the people who are loved and cared about, I, you know, I'll go straight this time. But nothing changed for 20 years. I'm not proud to say, nor am I ashamed. I'm not proud to say that 
I went back and back and back and back and all I ever did was hurt and harm and, and take drugs and, and Oscar Wilde says we save our venom for those we love the most. The most pain was committed to my family. Um, there's a quote by Goethe, this is probably the only time you'll hear an 18th century, you know, quoted by a Mancunian. This philosopher, um, Goethe, says, treat a man as you find him and you make him worse, but treat him as if he already were what he potentially could be and he'll become what he should be. So just hold that thought, because I'm, I'm going to give you three things that encompass my journey. Seeing the invisible, believing the incredible and attempting the impossible. Now I've got 10 minutes to take you on a bit of a journey and I'm going to bring you back to them three things. Until I seen somebody who was in recovery, I didn't believe it was possible. And until I'm believing on the inside, and, and it is an inside job, recovery, it has to happen in there, it's, it's not going to happen. And I was told it was possible, but I was never shown any evidence. I walked onto your prison wing on the TC community, give us a wave flow, salt of the earth, and that's where I started to learn that I've got some strengths. Up until that point, nobody had ever seen anything good in me. They'd always told me what I'm doing wrong and what I need to do, what I need to get in my life. Nobody had ever said, actually, you're really good at leading or you're really good at communicating or... No one had ever shown me unconditional positive regard until I met a prison officer and this prison officer sat on my bed and he opened a packet of cigarettes, he gave me one, he said, make us a, make us a brew, Pete, call me by my first name. And I remember that night I was reflecting, why, why was my heart beating so fast? Why was I really uncomfortable in that five minute intervention? Because that's what it was. Why was I so scared what was going on for me? And I realised up until that point in my life, even though what he was seeing was somebody who's a, a junkie, sorry to use them languages, I haven't grabbed hold of this new way of framing things yet, but there's the cold hard facts. As a prisoner, I'm right down there in society, and even in the prison setting, someone who's a, a class A heroin intravenous drug user is even deeper. So what he was seeing was me round down there, but what he was treating me as was someone who's got something to, to give, something to offer, and he believed in me. That unconditional positive regard frightened me. Because no one had ever shown me that type of love before, and it was a prison officer. It was someone who was meant to be on that other side of the fence. So that really got me thinking, that really messed up my head. And I went in the space of a year from being um, a problem prisoner, someone who, you know, the, the file that chronicalised my antecedents, my history, had to be carried in two hands. I went from being a problem prisoner to, to the solution, to one of three who was allowed, with two years still left to serve, it, it was deemed trustworthy enough to go out and work on a daily basis and come back and serve me time of a night, get me head down in the prison. <sighs> One day, because um, prisons are quite a hairy environment and that's where I grew up, that was my community. I lay on my bed one day and thought, one day I'm gonna come back in here and I'm gonna carry a message, but I couldn't, I couldn't share that vision with anyone because no one could see that and I knew he certainly won't believe it. Prison officers marched onto my farm one day and just dragged me in, uh, in, you know, went through security and they'd found a parcel of phones and drugs and I could not profess my innocence enough. But they weren't listening. They wasn't going to take any risks. They, they was just saying, look, you're not going back out. And I had to go from quite quite a safe environment to 
back onto where it was raw and where it was hardcore and where only two weeks previous at, at Sunday worship, one of the guys had said to me, Peter Merkel pull up, they'll put a thousand pound in your hand. Just make sure the parcel what they give you gets back in through, through mass to, to the wing. And I remember saying, you know, you're right, I haven't. I haven't got two pence to rub together and on a Friday when I have to fill out my canteen form I have to decide between soap and shampoo some weeks because I just haven't got that resource but a thousand pound can no way pay for what I've got on the inside. I mean that's the Sunday school version. I needed him to know I was serious so I served it up in a way that he understood I was serious and I wasn't going to ferry them, them contrabands through. So when I had to walk back onto that prison wing and listen to him shout my name with the word sellout attached to the back of it, I was scared. I was frightened living on that wing and, and yeah, I started to look pale and, and get depressed and I didn't want to come out of my cell to eat me dinner because I didn't know whether I was going to get filled in or not. And then the next thing, he's using drugs again, him, and that crippled me. So it was, I'm ferrying drugs in and now I'm bang at it. What I was was frightened and scared and vulnerable. And for the first time in my life, I could own that and say that's where I am today. And then it occurred to me, I've just spent two years on a therapeutic environment learning strategies to deal with situations like this. And it doesn't start when I get released. It starts now, because this is my community. So I had a look around that prison wing for other guys who was vulnerable, who was frightened, who was scared, who didn't want to come out of their cell and get involved in some of the hustle and bustle activities. And we set up a, a little mutual aid space. And we got a book, The Purpose Driven Life, from the library, and we said, Every night, we'll read a chapter and we'll educate ourselves. And that's when I first understood the power of peer support, of, of, of people in a similar situation banding together and saying, you know what, we've already got everything what we need. Let's start tapping into that. Fast forwarding on. Fortunate enough to get a part-time temporary job. Somebody believed in me. Um, and I, I'm eternally grateful for that opportunity because I dedicated my life to making sure that people who, who wasn't exposed to the same opportunities that I was got that opportunity. Um, I attended the first recovery walk in Cardiff in 2011 and you massively inspired me. So, seeing the invisible, people seeing something in me that I couldn't see in myself, believing the incredible, I had a vision, I knew I was going back to prison, and there's guys in this room who've heard me directly say, these are the things you're gonna challenge with when you get released, believing the incredible. Well, if you don't believe in me, I'm gonna know that. If you say you do, but you don't, I'm going to know it. And I think it was incredible to show belief into someone who's got a 20-year antecedents of hurt and harm that you can actually have an opportunity to contribute. So, thanks for listening. Well, that's been great.